Hello. I am Benicio Del Toro. I'm a Mercersburg graduate, class of 1985, and I'm glad to be back. Feels good to be back. You know, when they when they ask um, people to speak at commencement, I think that they're looking for alumni or notable people that uh, might who might have it all figured out and can share their secrets to their success. Unfortunately, I have no secrets <laughs> and I don't have it all figured out, I can assure you that. But what I can tell you is how I felt when I sat right there where you're sitting here today. And looking back at my experiences, I can, I can basically put something together, all these pieces together, and, um, and uh, make something that maybe may come in handy to some of you. Everyone here knows what it's like to be late, to be late to school or to work, but I don't mean that kind of late. I mean late like like you missed your chance to do what you feel you should really be doing, right? Well, let me tell you, about a month before my graduation, I was feeling pretty behind the curve as well. Like I said, late. I also felt this incredible sense of responsibility to especially my godmother who paid for my four years of high school here, and I also felt uh, um, I owed it to my godmother and my family because um, they had always put such value in education to make something of myself. After all, my great-grandparents started a tradition here. My grandfather graduated from here exactly 101 years ago, my uncle graduated from here, some of my cousins as well, and they all became professionals. So I was, uh, I was feeling uh, like you guys are feeling right now, pretty hot, and, uh, <laughs> and the pressure was on. Um, so with only uh, a, a few weeks uh, until graduation, I still had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I like painting, but uh, I wasn't going to be the next Andy Warhol. I could do a halfway decent portrait of mud, and that was about it. I liked music, but it seemed every time I read about a musician I liked, they were writing songs by the age of nine. I was 18. I was feeling way late. I also liked basketball, but I wasn't, I wasn't going to make a living at it. I wasn't going to go pro. None of it sounded right, and I couldn't decide what to do. So I did the only thing I could think of. I called my brother. He was the academic in the family, always inside reading books while I was outside getting into fun trouble, like a Puerto Rican Tom Sawyer. The, so. I thought if he had it figured out, maybe he could help me figure it out, right? And I don't know why, but for some reason he came right out and said it. You should be an actor. It was so out of left field, an actor. I've never shown any interest in theater or acting or anything of that sort. And the only performance he'd ever seen of mine was this so, so, Mick Jagger impression I used to do when my friends egged me on. And I mean, but I was a cocky 18 year old and a little self-indulgent. So in that moment, that crazy idea just sounded right. And so when I think about that phone call now, it reminds me of this beautiful thing that one of my favorite artists, um, Mary Rogers, a very important American painter, 
from the early 20th century once said about these kinds of experiences. Mary said that every human being has a song in their head and that it lingers in the back of our minds. She talked about letting that song sing to us. She said, it is in the nature of all people to have these experiences. At such times, there is a song going on within us, a song that if we listen to it, will fill us with surprise. And when my brother blurted, blurted that uh, idea out to me, I was definitely surprised. But I felt I could grab onto it. It made sense, it sounded right. So here I am in Fowl Hall with this big idea, and I'm walking back to my room where some of my friends are eating pizza, and I walk in and I say, guys, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an actor. Well, let me tell you something. To describe the response in that room was unimpressed. <laughs> One of my friends, you know, tells me it's a terrible idea, <laughs> impractical, profoundly unlikely. <laughs> nice guy, real supportive. Hey, it took 10 minutes for my idea to flatline. My big idea dead on arrival. And then my own commencement arrived. And standing in the same place I'm standing right now was the then senator from Maryland, Charles Mathias. And he quoted, and he just did exactly what I did. He quoted someone that really left an impression on him. Pablo Casals, a famous Spanish cellist a man so passionate that during the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, when the military dictator Franco took Spain, he decided he would not do another public concert unless democracy was restored in his homeland. So Senator Mathias quoted Casals with this. Every leaf on every tree is different. In the same way, every human being is unique. And in the millions of years of human evolution, there has never been anyone like you. And as I sat here front row, I thought about my friends telling me how risky and reckless my plan was. Hey, maybe they were right, maybe not. But why should I give up before trying, right? So I tried. I went to college to the University of California, San Diego, and I signed up to Acting 101. Hey, sounded pretty easy, huh? I mean, if there was homework, it'd be to go to see movies, which is something I already did anyway, <laughs> right? And the first day of class, the teacher walks in, and he walks in, and he looks at us, and he goes, you guys are 18 or 19, you're the right age to start studying acting because now you know a little bit more about life than, and you can draw from your own experiences much better than you could when you were 14. And boom, in my head, that was an incredible feeling. It was the first time in my life that I felt that I was on time for something. And, I, and it really, it's really if, the first time I ever really felt like that. And suddenly I'm in the classroom but it doesn't feel like a classroom. It's fun. And the idea of class or work, that it could be enjoyable, that it didn't have to be a drag or a grind, was a novelty to me. Hey, but I wasn't naive. I knew that, the, that I figured out quickly that having fun was going to be the product of hard work. And that was OK with me. So at that moment, I decided that I was going to do this acting thing for the rest of my life, whether I made a living at it or not. And after my first year, I decided to leave and go to leave college and move to New York and pursue an acting career. And soon enough, my father and my godmother were telling me they were not going to help me financially unless I went back to school and finish. 
and after a series of little jobs here and there and sleeping in my, in, uh, on, my, on my cousin's couch and having no real income in New York City, I waved that white flag to my family, surrendered, and decided to go back to college. On my way back to Los Angeles, I stopped in Los Angeles to see my brother who was going to UCLA. And while I was there, I went to see a talent agent and she told me that the Stella Adler Conservatory for Acting was holding auditions for a two-year scholarship. So I get an audition and two days before I'm supposed to go in, I go visit the school. And I meet one of the teachers in the program and he looks at me and he goes, why do you want to study acting here? And I knew the answer. The answer was because I wanted to learn. But for some reason, instead, I said, because I wanted to be in the middle of everything. You know, Hollywood. <laughs> and he takes a, one look at me and says, I'll tell you what you should do. You should go lay out in the sun, get a tan. You should join a gym, hit the weights. And you should get one of those magazines like the Hollywood Reporter. And in the back pages, it will tell you where the auditions are. You don't need no acting school. You don't need to study here. And just like that, he walked away and left me standing there all alone, staring at a fake plastic plant in the corner of the room. I felt awful. I mean, he was saying I was superficial, that I wasn't in it for the right reasons. And this wasn't even the audition, you know? It was two days before. I was so angry, I wanted to cancel the audition. But something spoke to me. Hey, maybe it was a dare. So I turned that frustration into a dare. Hey, why not, right? And I went in, and to make a long story short, I got the audition. I got the scholarship, the two-year scholarship. The Stella Adler Conservatory was serious about acting. Stella wanted people with courage, with conviction, with instinct. And I passed the first test. I showed that I could commit, which is exactly what I did. And I learned many things there, and I learned finally to sit still and read play after play and uh, try to understand what the writers are trying to say. I learned that without imagination, an artist is a mechanic. I learned to listen and to take criticism. I learned that being Hispanic with a Puerto Rican accent, I'd have to work four times harder than everybody else. And that was okay with me. I also learned that with this acting thing, it could move people. And most important, I learned that what I was doing mattered was one of the most important decisions in my life, and I think about it now, and I, it's, a, it's kind of re relevant to what I want to say here today. Look, everyone is going to draw lines for you, especially when they think you should, achieved some, you should have achieved something or proved something or become something by a specific time. But it's your job to reimagine these lines. It's your job to cross them, to jump them, and in some cases, to ignore them altogether. But first, you must have conviction in what you're doing. If you don't know why you believe in something, why should I believe what you have to say? Don't do something for trophies or medals. Do it because it will transform your life or someone else's. Don't do it because it's easy, even though I've done that before. Do it because it's something that will inspire you to learn and to keep on learning regardless of whether you're sitting in a classroom or not. Second, you should try to understand where the people are coming from, where other people are coming from. And by that I mean those doubts, those lines. You know, my friend in Fowl Hall, he was being pragmatic, a bit obnoxious, but in his own way helpful. My family, when I decided to move to New York, they knew that the life of an actor is a very unstable and uh, difficult one. So they wanted me to go back to college so I could have something to fall back on. A teacher, Estella Adler, who got me so angry, he taught me that to reimagining that line, I could turn frustration into accomplishment. Listen, I've made a career of trying to get into other people's heads, trying to feel what they're feeling. 
And as the Native American saying goes, to know a man, walk a mile in his shoes. And the same could be said about any job. To be a doctor, you must listen to the pa a patient. To be a lawyer, you must know that there's three sides to every story, yours, theirs, and the truth. And to be an activist, you must, you must believe that you must believe in every lie, every, that every life and every story matters. And remember, remember that understanding where someone else is coming from, from is a big part of knowing where you're going. And third, remember what Mary Rogers, that wonderful painter from Pittsburgh, was saying. She reminded us that that song, that original idea, can fill us with wonder and surprise. But she also warned us that things can drown it out, like our own cold intellect, putting doubts in our own heads. Doubts like, hey, you know, that's not good enough, or who do you think you are? or no one has ever done that before, or, you know, that's too hard. All those doubts. She was encouraging us to hold on to these ideas, to consider them, to protect them, and have the confidence to find expression for them. It's just a beautiful way of saying, trust your instincts. You know what, what will feel right. We've already seen the compassion and the courage of so many young people your age. You truly are like, unlike any other generation that has come before. From the students at Parkland, to the young activists in Chicago, to the dreamers, we have a vast nation of young people who have decided they no longer need to doubt their ability to help lead movements of change. And that includes all of you. And if I may return, return to what Pablo Casals was saying, there is no one like you, but there will never be anyone like you. So believe that. And um, if you forget everything else from today, just know that I sat exactly where you are. And for a brief moment, I let my guard down, and I put aside the lines from others, and even the lines I drew for myself. And I knew that I could be different, unique, my own self. So know this, lines are just lessons. And most of the lines I faced came not from the classroom, but from the world around me, and perhaps from myself as well. So look around, keep the song in your head. Don't wait for someone to test you or to dare you. And if they do, if it happens, just say, go fly a kite. <laughs> Have a little fun. Congratulations, class of 2018. Best of luck, enjoy yourselves, and God bless. Thank you.